Welcome back. Is reality TV in for a reckoning? What's going on this week with me at BravoCon and all that needs to be caught up on with regard to both Tom and Erica Girardi, plus a little bit of a conversation about Shannon Bedore's recent DUI arrest and charges and what that means and what that looks like in Southern California. So that's what we're doing today. That's what we need to talk about. It is a Housewives kind of a week because it is BravoCon week and my brain is just very much Bravo, Bravo, fucking Bravo. So let's go. Welcome to The Emily Show. I'm Emily D. Baker, the internet's go-to legal analyst and big fan of the cursey words. I've been a licensed attorney for over 17 years. I'm a former prosecutor and I break down the legal side of pop culture and entertainment stories we can't stop talking about. We should just get into it. Let's go. A huge thank you to today's sponsor, Green Chef, for, well, being basically the only reason I have a healthy dinner every night because it's delivered to my door with fresh, healthy ingredients, with meals that I can choose. And there are so many to choose from this fall. No matter what your lifestyle looks like, whether it's keto or paleo or vegan and vegetarian, you can pick from over 80 different weekly meals. When you get the dinners delivered, all of the ingredients you need are there with really simple to follow instructions. And you can also add things on like my beloved egg bites, which when I am not running out in the morning are the first thing that I grab with my coffee. And the holiday meals that they add into their menu are absolutely fantastic. So if you're also looking for special meals, they have those too. And right now we have Green Chef's best deal of the year for you. Get $250 off with code EMILYBAKER250 at greenchef.com slash EMILYBAKER250. Remember, you need to use that code EMILYBAKER250 at greenchef.com slash EMILYBAKER250 to get your $250 off. Find out for yourself why Green Chef is my favorite and is the number one meal kit for eating well. Let's get back to today's episode. One of the newer news stories in all things Housewives is, well, the Vanity Fair article that we're going to talk about in a minute that came out the day I'm recording this and the fact that Shannon Bedore, a real housewife of Orange County, has been charged with DUI and DUI hit and run. Uh, the interesting thing about this is not just that she was charged with the DUI and DUI hit and run. We knew about the DUI. We knew that she had collided with the building that she had injured herself, it looks like broken an arm or a wrist, but it also gotten out of the car and pretended that she was walking her dog somewhere down the way from where the accident happened. So it is still alleged that she fled the scene of that accident and then was trying to pretend like nothing happened. She was arrested after 1.15 in the morning, according to reports from um, TMZ and from People. And now that she's been charged, it is clear that she had a 0.24 blood alcohol level. For those of you not in the United States, and we do have a large international audience, in the United States, 0.08 is the legal limit. And in California, there are enhancements to DUI, meaning you can bump up the amount of time that someone gets or the amount of fines that they pay or both with alcohol limit enhancements. So over a 0.15 is discretionary, over a 0.20 there is an enhancement and working in the criminal law space for quite a long time, I saw DUIs of all varieties. This is not one of the highest BACs I've seen in my life and in my work, but it is not a low blood alcohol. I'd be interested to see if they're going to argue if this was blood alcohol still going up or if this was blood alcohol coming down, but 0.24 is a substantial BAC, and it is going to mean that the prosecutors looking at this are going to have, A, more enhancements added. The fact that she collided with a building and didn't hurt anyone is really, truly lucky uh, for all involved, but also something that will enhance the way that this is treated. These are still misdemeanor cases. She's probably already had her license suspended in the state of California by the DMV. That's an administrative proceeding that goes along once this arrest is made and once the police reports are in, that proceeding happens separately to the criminal proceeding. So she will absolutely 
lose her license for a period of time. How substantial that period of time is partly will depend on what happens with the prosecution. These are the types of cases that resolve with a plea deal. Most of these plea deals do not involve any jail time at all, though with a blood alcohol this high, I could see some substantial fines and substantial community service, drug alcohol treatment classes and things like that. So we will see. The charges have officially been brought by the Orange County District Attorney's Office. We will see what they choose to do. I imagine it would be at least a three-year probation, if not more. She's going to have to pay restitution for the damage that she did to the building that she collided with. And if she gets arrested for anything alcohol-related in the near future, it's going to be a huge problem. We have seen reports that she has already sought some type of treatment. That's not uncommon, especially when people hire private attorneys. Most private defense attorneys in the criminal realm, especially when facing DUI cases, will tell the person before they even go to court that they need to seek some sort of drug or alcohol program. And then when they go into court for the initial arraignment, we'll say to the judge, they need to stay out of custody. They've already taken responsibility. They're taking these classes. This is why they should have leniency in a plea deal because they're already taking it so seriously. So it's not uncommon that that is likely the advice that she's been given. And again, that's speculation based on what has been reported in the media that she's already sought some type of treatment um, to deal with alcohol. What's interesting is that this is a reality TV personality. The subject of reality TV personalities and drinking is something that came up heavily in the Vanity Fair article that dropped on Monday, October 30th. And it's something that has been repeatedly brought up to Shannon over the last several seasons of Real Housewives of Orange County. I wonder how much the prosecutors will bring up. It seems that this individual has a ongoing issue with alcohol. However, I would argue that that argument, Emily, how many times can you say argument in one sentence? I would argue that that argument could be made based on the fact that she was still able to get into, start, and operate a vehicle to some degree of success at a point two four. Not everyone at that level of intoxication would be able to get into a car, open up a car door, get into a car, and operate a vehicle any distance or length of space. So there's going to be some argument that um, this is clearly not the first time she has ever imbibed in alcohol uh, based on that BAC and her actions while at that level of BAC. And of course, they will have all of the body cam footage from police officers, body cam footage from the scene, body cam footage from any field sobriety tests that were done, any conversations she had with police, and and things like that. So with all of it, um, don't drink and drive. Uber is a thing. Um, Drinking and driving can be deadly, not just for those who are drinking and driving, but for those around them. One of the highest BACs I ever saw was a collision with a, the drunk driver collided with a family that was taking their kids to school at 8.45 a.m. So I know a lot of people are like, well, if I'm not out on the road at 2 a.m. when people are driving home, and I get it, this arrest was at 1.15 in the morning, that you're not necessarily at risk for that. But I have seen DUI-related collisions at all times of day, at all varying levels of BAC, um, some that I was shocked that people were honestly still able to speak with law enforcement. So uh, that is my that is my don't drink and drive. Um, Uber is a thing. And um, yeah, there's just th- 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 nothing good is going to come of it. The fact that no one was injured other than her um, is frankly just very, very good luck that what she collided with was a building and not another car. So let us continue to talk about reality television stars and alcohol, because that is a whole lot of what this Vanity Fair Reality Reckoning article is about. And I did not intend to talk that long about Shannon, so we're gonna talk less long about this because we have lots of Girardi updates that we need to get to. Thank you to our sponsor, Jenny Kane. I can't believe it's already the season to start thinking about gift giving. And this time of year, I love to give the gift of cozy. And Jenny Kane makes that so easy because everything on their website is so chic and easy to find something 
that will be delightful for the home for whoever you are shopping for. From hand poured candles in Los Angeles that are lovely and fragrant to amazing throws and pillows that will elevate any room to incredible flatware and dining pieces that are going to be easy to serve a holiday meal on. If you haven't checked out Jenny Kane before, let me point you to the farmhouse throw. Not only is it luxuriously plush, but it is also lightweight, which is key for me. It's the perfect addition for a cozy evening and would be a lovely gift for anyone in your life. And if you're ready to gift yourself the gift of savings, Emily Show listeners get 15% off their first order at JennyKane.com slash home when you use code LONARD. That's JennyKane.com slash home. J-E-N-N-I-K-A-Y-N-E dot com slash home and use code LONARD for 15% off your first order. Let's get back to today's episode. The Vanity Fair article that came out on October 30th, I don't think it's a coincidence that it has dropped the Monday before BravoCon starts later this week, talks a lot about alcohol and the shows. The title of the article is Inside the Real Housewives Reckoning That's Rocking Bravo, and it starts with a kind of header image of Bethany Frankel. So from this, you already take away the idea that this article is going to go over a lot of what we've already heard Bethany Frankel talking about all over her own social media. And that is that it's time for a reckoning in reality TV. There's time to have a conversation about how much production is responsible for the safety of the cast, including their mental health and mental well being. If reality TV personalities should be granted residuals how they should be treated, how they should be protected in the workplace, and why reality TV is kind of outside this little bubble of entertainment. And there are lots of these little caveats of entertainment like reality where the rules that apply in a different setting on television are completely different than what's acceptable on reality TV, which really started to grow during the last writer's strike. Though reality TV has a long history dating well back to the real world days and possibly before reality tv in this iteration really started to boom during the last writer's strike because you're not writing lines for people you're editing together plot line after and you're using producers to help drive plot line which is if you are not familiar with the behind the scenes of reality tv this article might be helpful to show you a little more from the behind the scenes of reality tv but the article starts with the housewife woke up in her own urine. She was still drunk from the night before when she'd had three drinks at dinner, another three or four with her co-stars, then an indeterminate but deliberating amount of mezcal after her castmates went to sleep. The house had been fully stocked when they arrived. So from the beginning of this, you can see the direction that this article is going in and continues to go in, talking about where the line is for drinking on reality TV, how much drinking there is on reality TV, should there be rules about drinking on reality TV, how different shows and different franchises have dealt with limits on that and how NBC Universal hasn't, but maybe is starting to. And I think it's directly attributable to Leah McSweeney, but when Leah talks about being on reality TV, they talk about this incident again, saying the van hired for the day trip pulled over so the housewife could throw up. When the crew saw what was happening, they rushed over and she said not to help but to document it. Bravo didn't wind up airing the footage. Production did bring in a doctor who gave the real housewife a shot. She pulled down her pants on camera and took it while a castmate held her hand. Quote, if you go to the whorehouse, you're going to get fucked said another Real Housewife. She knows what you think, that if you sign up to be on a Bravo reality show, you deserve what you get. And she agrees. Quote, if we do this, it's at our own peril. We know that and we don't fucking care. So this article explores both sides of reality TV. The devastating dark side of trying to stay on reality TV, the fact that you will push yourselves beyond maybe your comfort zone with drinking 
with fighting with other things because you want to stay on the show and what you are going to do when that spotlight ends. And that is really the setting of this article. Some former housewife saying there has to be some protections here and asking to build in those protections because people are willing to override their own boundaries and red flags because it pushes storyline and they want to be on TV more because I'm sure all of them are acutely aware that there are plenty of other, especially with the Housewives franchises, plenty of other individuals who want to be on television because it can be a launching stone to fame or infamy, to products, to other shows, and people want to be on television, which doesn't make any sense to me. You could just be on YouTube. You can watch it on your TV. I d um, I don't understand. Yes, there's argument that maybe YouTube doesn't get as much reach as Bravo, but I'd argue that the big YouTube channels get much more reach than Bravo network shows. But it is a look at mostly the issues that Bethany Frankel has been bringing up, the issues that Leah McSweeney has brought up and her own journey through the fact that she was sober, um, was no longer sober when she was on the show, and then fought back for her sobriety and what it was like behind the scenes when people were pushing her to break her sobriety and what that was like for her. And then they also spoke to Ebony Williams, who talked about the racial tension and racial comments made during the last season of Legacy Real Housewives of New York with some of the behind the scenes things that had happened between production and Ramona Singer. Ramona Singer going on to continue to work with different properties on Bravo, even though not Real Housewives of New York, because it was just completely recast. But the upset on New York was such that the last season of Real Housewives of New York, there was no reunion ever filmed. It just stopped. And talking about that. So it really takes you through the stories of three different housewives and the problems that they see with reality TV, but others who also say, this is what you sign up for. This is what the game is. And if you're going to play the game, then you need to lean in and play the game or not. So I'd be interested to see your thoughts on it. Do I think the Vanity Fair article is going to take down Bravo? Do I think Bravo is grappling with a reality reckoning? I think it mirrors the audience. I think the audience is dealing with a reality reckoning. I think from what I've seen, reality TV used to be an escape. Um, the competition shows used to seem really fun, but now everyone knows so much about the behind the scenes and how it works. We've had so many past contestants talk about the toll it has taken on their physical health, on their mental health, on their relationships, how the stuff that happens on shows spills over into real life, how the things that happens on shows spill over onto social media. We've seen children of cast members getting harassed, Garcelle's children getting harassed on social media. We've seen some awful things happen because of the shows. And I think the real reckoning is not just do cast members need to get paid residuals and why don't they when others do, but also is this still entertainment anymore or has it gotten to the point where it is too hard to watch people choosing to let themselves suffer on television for entertainment because that's how they think they're going to get more airtime. Does it feel real anymore or does it just feel forced? And what is that like behind the scenes for the people involved in it? It's an interesting thing to watch because more and more we have seen the cost of trying to keep up the appearances of an opulent lifestyle come crumbling down. And that is what we are going to talk about next. We got to talk about the Girardis. One of the things I appreciate about Quip is they are super ADHD friendly because they will deliver to you the things that you need on a regular basis. Gum, floss, mints, toothpaste, including the electric toothbrush that comes in this incredible tube that doubles as a case and a stand. So when I am traveling, it just sits right on the countertop. The Sonic toothbrush has timed vibrations so you know which quadrant of your mouth to clean and brush for the full amount of time. Quip's water flosser is so easy to travel with because you can just pop off the top and 
carry it with you. I also love the matte black everything. And finally, to keep breath fresh at all of the conventions I've been going to, the gum or mint dispenser, you can pick what you wanna put in it and they work just like a Pez dispenser. So head to getquip.com slash Emily Show to get 20% off your electronic toothbrush, water flosser, or mint or gum dispenser. That's 20% off any electronic toothbrush, water flosser, or mint or gum dispenser at getquip.com slash Emily Show. Spelled G-E-T-Q-U-I-P dot com slash Emily Show. Quip, the good habits company. Let's get back to today's episode. So when we look at how real is reality tv one of the things reality tv always sold if it wasn't competition shows was escapism into someone else's lives and with real housewives of beverly hills it was escape into the glitz and the glamour of those that live in beverly hills that's where i wanna be and the houses and the lifestyles and the clothes and the money and the private jets and the jewelry that was supposed to be kind of a a look at the lifestyles of the rich and the famous emily are you now going to also sing lifestyles of the rich and the famous yes it was a look into the post robin leach lifestyles of the rich and the famous the real life the friendships you know all of the rest of it but over the seasons has it continued to feel real especially as we've seen some of the the richest housewives um fall from grace so for those of you new to the girardi saga i am going to try to road so far the three going on four years of coverage of this case tom girardi was one of the most prominent plaintiffs attorneys in california and the u.s he had multiple billion dollar settlements against pharmaceutical companies and others. He represented catastrophic injury clients, people who had been hurt in gas leak explosions and toxic water. He had been brought in to the Aaron Brockovich case and used that being made into a movie and that being one of the, the first large multi-million dollar plaintiff settlement to build his career. Long before he ever started dating Erica Girardi, erica jane who is still on the real housewives of beverly hills we have seen her say things like i spend forty thousand dollars a month on glam and do we want to take the big jet or the small jet do we want to do this that and the other thing um and flaunt insane amounts of wealth and a very large age gap marriage with a man who she said that she loved who was very supportive of her who let her make multi-million dollar music videos and build her music career. And we saw all that play out on the show. Then, November 2020, Erica Girardi files for divorce on election day. Maybe thinking the story would get buried. Shortly after that, a lawsuit comes out in Illinois from the Edelson law firm alleging that the divorce is a sham, that the money is gone, that Tom Girardi had been stealing from mutual clients between the Girardi Keese law firm and the Edelson PC law firm. They were representing um, the survivors of individuals who had perished in a, the Lion Air Boeing crash. It had come to Edelson PC's attention that the clients hadn't been paid, even though Boeing had already paid and that hit the media and started unwinding everything i think because of the allegation that the divorce was a sham and this is a couple that people had seen play out on tv and i think a lot of the audience had been rooting for they genuinely seemed to have a mutual respect and a care for one another now we know it is uh all for the cameras and erica since leaving that marriage has said that he was not supportive at all and that this was a very difficult marriage to be in. That's not necessarily how things were presented in the book that she had written, but also I understand keeping up appearances when your job is to be on reality TV. So with all of that, we saw Tom Girardi and his law firm both forced into bankruptcy. In the bankruptcy, it has been uncovered that there are hundreds of millions of dollars unpaid, that there is not going, like, 
The water is freezing and there are not enough lifeboats. I keep comparing this case to the Titanic because the iceberg was there um, and no one saw it for decades. We have seen investigations by the California State Bar showing hundreds of complaints against Girardi. Lots of them alleging clients weren't being paid their settlements. This had gone on for somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 years. It's wild that it went on for so long. Then, after the bankruptcy got rolling, then came the indictments. So when you're sitting there going, this sounds like a crime. Yep, crime. Then came the indictments in California and in Illinois. Today, we are taking a look at what's going on with the California indictment of Tom Girardi because he has been having competency hearings to determine whether or not now in his mid 80s, he is competent mentally to stand for the criminal trials. The bankruptcies are still working their way along. Don't worry, more's going on with the scandal earrings. We'll talk about that in the next segment of today's show. So we're just going to look at what's going on with Tom Girardi's competency in the California indictment. There is going to be competency proceedings unless something resolves in the Illinois indictment as well. This is going to have to happen because at the very beginning of the Girardi bankruptcy, Tom Girardi very, very quickly went into a conservatorship. What we are seeing from Erica, and we heard her talk about this, she just recently did a podcast, uh, the Hashtag No Filter podcast with Zach Peter, and she talks about the fact that she had seen a mental decline in Tom Girardi prior to her leaving, and we have seen her say that on the show as well. We have seen her say multiple times now that there were issues that she saw cognitively before any of this came up. But when the bankruptcy happened, it was like all of a sudden he was very quickly in a conservatorship saying that he was not able to take care of his own affairs. If that's what was going on, the other lawyers at his firm, I have a lot of questions for you if anyone else noticed a mental decline, including his son-in-law, who's also now been indicted. So there's a lot to parse through here. There is lots of coverage on the podcast and on YouTube about it. This is one of the most staggering legal scandals to me in how long it went on and how Tom Girardi had people seemingly paid off at the California bar to not investigate him. People who were getting cars, their kids were on payroll at the Girardi Keys firm. There was so much corruption and impropriety that allowed this to go on. And we are now seeing that all come home to roost. We've seen excellent reporting from the LA Times. The LA Times pressed, you know, the way journalists used to do. It was like old school journalism pressed the California State Bar and took them to court over disclosing their investigations. And I was just like, yes, LA Times, go go forth. Find out what they're investigating and why. Find out how many times Tom Girardi had been reported for not paying clients and how nothing happened. Because when you're in law school, they tell you, look, if there are three cents out of place in your client trust account, you're basically gonna get disbarred. Um, excuse me. There's hundreds of millions of dollars here of debts that have been uncovered in this bankruptcy. Not all of it's to clients, but, but, but how are we here? So this is a story that has been going on for years. When I first started covering it, every single time I covered it, I was like, I can't believe there's more. I can't believe there's more. I am not surprised by much anymore. And I don't think this is going to resolve quickly. So, but wait, there's more has kind of stopped. So in the criminal indictment, and I've broken down the entire California and Illinois criminal indictments for you. I'll link those in the show notes. In the criminal indictment, Tom Girardi's um, attorneys said that he was not competent to stand trial. Competency in California means that the individual, Tom Girardi, the defendant, is able to meaningfully participate in their defense and understands the natures of the proceedings going on. That is kind of the baseline for competency. It is a difficult standard to meet 
But when people are not competent to stand trial, it generally presents itself uh, fairly noticeably. We also covered this in the Taylor Shabizness business case because her attorney had argued about her competency to stand trial back and forth, and she had always been found competent to stand trial. So the motions going on right now are coming after the in-court hearings on whether or not Tom Girardi can meet that standard. Can he help with the defense at this time? And does he understand the proceedings going on around him? We did see that he got enraged while he was in court and did say to the prosecutor or in the direction of the prosecutor, fuck you. So um, he seemed to understand the nature of the proceedings against him based on that interaction, enough that he was mad about it, but we'll have to see what the judge does. So here's the latest order on that. This is the judge's amended scheduling order from September 13th, 2023, defendant's motion for order finding incompetency. This matter is called and counsel stated their appearances. An evidentiary hearing is held. Witnesses are sworn and testified. Exhibits identified and admitted to evidence. The court and counsel confer. As stated on the record, the court sets the following briefing schedule. The court had multiple days of hearings on the competency of Tom Jordy with witnesses and expert witnesses. The court then set an additional briefing schedule to clarify issues after the hearings. This is that schedule. The government shall file their brief 30 days from the receipt of the final transcripts. The opposition shall be filed three weeks after opening briefs. Any replies shall be filed two weeks after the opposition. Upon the filing of the briefing, the motion is taken under submission. There is not going to be another hearing. There is just going to be additional briefing. The transcript has been filed. It has been 30 days. And on October 27th, the government filed their opening brief, which means we now have three weeks for the opposition, two weeks from that for the reply, and then the court will take it under submission. Do I think we'll have a ruling on Tom Girardi's competency before the end of the year? I think it's unlikely. I mean, it's possible, but I wouldn't be holding your breath waiting for a ruling on this before the end of the year. Keep in mind, Emily, you haven't told us yet. Fair. I'll have you keep in mind that on the companion case, because not only has Tom Girardi been indicted, but his CFO has been indicted in California. The other attorneys were indicted in Illinois, but the CFO that's been indicted in California just put their trial over from December to March. So that trial is trailing along, waiting for something to be resolved on the competency of Tom Girardi because the cases are so intertwined. So what we are going to do is look at the government's brief briefly to go over what issues the court is asking them to brief right now, what the arguments are still outstanding after the hearings, which will give us an idea of what the court is looking at. So again, filed October 27th. This is from the United States. This is their government's post-hearing brief for order finding defendant Tom Girardi competent to stand trial. Here's the introduction of the memorandum of points and authorities. Defendant Tom Girardi is competent to stand trial. Unrebutted evidence presented during the three-day competency hearing confirmed the information provided in the pre-hearing briefing, both demonstrating that in the months and weeks leading up to his precipitous purported decline, defendant was continuing to practice law, communicate with clients, negotiate with lenders, and manage his law firm, which handled hundreds of active matters that he oversaw. Although the court heard lay witness testify testimony about defendant's occasional forgetfulness and disorientation, and the government's own expert diagnosed him with mild cognitive impairment, mere cognitive decline is not the standard in determining whether a defendant is presently competent to stand trial. Rather, the court need only determine by a preponderance of the evidence, that is a very low standard, a very low standard, a preponderance is like a, a smidge, it's not beyond a reasonable doubt. It's a preponderance is a low standard of evidence. We're in the more likely than not territory. So the court only needs to determine by a very low standard whether Girardi has the rational factual understanding of the proceeding against him and is able to consult with his counsel with a reasonable degree of rational understanding. That does not say total degree. That says a reasonable degree. 
They go on to argue that the government has met this standard. The testimony at the hearing not only failed to undercut the government's showing, it often supported it. The government presented testimony from two experts, Dr. Diana Goldstein and Dr. Ryan Darby, who each opined that the defendant was presently competent. We've got a sidebar real quick here. The thing with competency is that this can change throughout the proceedings. So <laughs> keep in mind that even if the court deems Girardi presently competent, that during the course of a prosecution, this can change and have to be addressed again if the defense attorney declares a doubt again and says, look, his cognition has changed. I don't think he is presently competent. It is dealing with present competency. And that can shift down the road. The government goes on to say their opinions were based in part on defendants' medical records, neurocognitive testing, collateral interviews, and importantly, their own interactions and observations of the defendant. Each opined that the defendant was exaggerating the extent of his condition, and each identified material inconsistencies in his clinical presentation. So the doctors for the prosecution say that he was exaggerating the extent of his condition, which would also tend to show that he is competent to realize that not being competent benefits him. Hopefully that makes sense. They go on to say, far from an awareness of this case or an inability to form new memories, defendant tracked the allegations against him, offered a variety of excuses for his criminal conduct, and discussed matters that only recently transpired. He further described rationally and specifically how he would defend himself against such allegations. Defense counsel, on the other hand, proffered only one expert, Dr. Stacy Wood, who claimed that defendant was incompetent. However, Dr. Wood admitted that she failed to consider contemporaneous evidence of defendant's cognitive functioning leading up to his claimed incompetency, evidence that directly contradicts the trajectory of his claimed impairment. So didn't look at him running his law firm into the ground, then it all going ass over tea kettle, and then him going up. Oh, not competent. They go on to say, throughout these proceedings, defendant has exhibited an understanding of the criminal charges in this case and the ability to confer meaningfully with his counsel if he so chooses. Accordingly, the court should find the defendant competent. It goes on to say that the defendant has been malingering since faking since late 2020. The question of defendant's competency in large part hinges on whether he is feigning and or exaggerating the extent of his condition. Any purposeful effort by defendant to manipulate these proceedings and make himself look more impaired than he truly is would certainly demonstrate his appreciation of this criminal matter and its potential consequences and exceed the low threshold for establishing competency. I should have kept reading. It's like the prosecutors and the prosecutor think the same way. It's like, right, well, if you are exaggerating it to get out of trouble, shows that you appreciate the fact that you are in trouble. Accordingly, as defendant's own expert conceded when tasked with evaluating an individual's competence, one must be critical of the claimed symptoms and scrutinize them. This is especially true in criminal cases where defendants are incentivized to feign the extent of their impairment. Nevertheless, neither defense expert critically examined defendant's purported symptoms. As an initial matter, Dr. Chu, uh, Chui, readily conceded that she was not asked to conduct a competency evaluation, nor did she have any expertise in the field. Then what did they call her for? She further admitted that she has never conducted a forensic evaluation before, nor does she have any forensic evaluation training. And while Dr. Wood purportedly conducted a forensic evaluation, she conceded during cross-examination that she both failed to consider relevant evidence of defendants malingering and in some cases, failed to adequately explain or even acknowledge his inconsistent presentation. Um, the defense expert failed to consider evidence of malingering is a problem. And if you're flashing back to other trials I've covered, there are other trials I've covered where the two sides of forensic psychologists fight with each other over evidence of malingering, exaggerated symptoms, 
this comes up when you have a battle of the experts. Generally doesn't come up when all the experts agree. When all the experts agree, we don't often see these hearings because everybody agrees and then you proceed that way. Evidence of defendant's intentional malingering from December 2020 when he first claimed incompetency in connection with the Lion Air civil matter is relevant to an evaluation of defendant's current competence. That is, if defendant were exaggerating his impairments in 2020 by claiming, among other things, that he did not appreciate the allegations against him. By appreciate, they don't mean like he liked it, they mean perceive it. Then his identical claims in 2023 may likewise be exaggerated. However, when repeatedly asked whether she considered defendant's previous claims of incompetence, Dr. Wood claimed they were not relevant to her evaluation. She did not ask for any evidence of defendant's capabilities in 2020 because she believed it was not relevant to her, quote, focus on his current cognitive abilities. And I think the defense is saying, well, his cognition in 2020 and his cognition in 2023 are different things, and we're here for current competence. I can see the defense argument there. It goes on to say, but Dr. Wood's failure to review and analyze the timing and context of defendant's initial claims of incompetency undercuts the reliability of her opinion. For example, when presented with defendant's voicemails and letters from 2020, Dr. Wood conceded that defendant's capabilities at that time were inconsistent with his claims of incompetence. And then they have a segment of the transcript here saying, question, is that significant to you? Does that tend to contradict the claim? Answer, um, yes, potentially. And then it goes on to quote, would you agree that this is inconsistent with the claim? Answer, it does seem to be. It then goes on to say that although admitted from her report, Dr. Wood admitted during cross-examination, the defendant was probably not incompetent in 2020 and that he was likely suffering from MCI rather than dementia. Dr. Wood's failure to consider this relevant evidence of malingering undercuts the accuracy and reliability of her opinion. It goes on to say that Dr. Wood further failed to acknowledge defendant's inconsistent clinical presentation, both in her expert report and during her testimony. When confronted with defendant's purported lack of memory that he had a third wife and his incongruous statements about past United States wars and presidents, Dr. Wood refused to consider that they may represent efforts to initially manipulate the proceedings. For example, Dr. Wood blamed such inconsistent presentation on frontal lobe atrophy. However, she acknowledged that defendant's most recent brain scans place him in the 70th percentile for frontal lobe volume, well above average. It goes on to say Dr. Wood further admitted that despite defendant's incongruous answers regarding historical facts, such if that's how you're testing my mental acuity, I don't know how far we're going to get. <laughs> I am very ADHD. When was this person present? I don't know. Please don't ask me. I would not do well. Um, it goes on to say Dr. Wood further admitted that despite defendant's incongruous answers regarding historical facts, such as incorrect statements regarding past presidents and wars, these facts are not short-term memories that are typically affected in the beginning stages of dementia. She ultimately conceded that his responses were quote unquote unusual. Furthermore, Dr. I think it's Chewy, C-H-U-I, admitted that she did not conduct any tests for malingering when she evaluated the defendant. She likewise did not consider defendant's capabilities in late 2020, for example, his role as a moderator at a live streamed panel discussion regarding the law at which he was a featured guest, but admitted that such information would be relevant to a determination of defendant's mental abilities at the time he first raised the claim of incompetence. Dr. Chewy also failed to consider the suspicious timing of defendant's claims of incompetence starting in late December 2020. Right, when everything went to shit. That is the first time this was a problem. He was practicing law up to the moment that everything went wild. Well, that everything came to light. It goes on to say Dr. Shui also failed to consider the suspicious timing of defendant's claims of incompetence starting in December 2020. Indeed, her role as defendant's treating physician presented a conflict with her instant assignment. As a treating physician, she took an oath to help her patients and act in their best interest, which she readily conceded was different from a forensic evaluation. Yeah, you don't normally have the treating doctor as the forensic evaluators, the treating doctors are supposed to take in what the patient is telling them and work off of that. Um, it's not their job to forensically evaluate their patient. It says that her lack of effort to determine whether defendant was feigning or exaggerating symptoms of cognitive dysfunction 
or indeed to question whether a defendant could be exaggerating or feigning impairment, thus cast doubts on the reliability and accuracy of her opinion. They go on to say both defense doctors put significant weight on collateral interviews rife with incomplete information. For example, uh, Dr. Chewy relied on defendant's daughter, Jennifer Crane, who was estranged from her father for many years prior to his conservatorship in 2021. So then how would she know? The doctor testified that a reliable collateral informant is someone who, quote, knows the patient well and is familiar with symptoms and the context in which they're occurring. Despite alleging the defendant's purported memory decline began in 2017, by her own admission, Ms. Crane, the daughter, had not seen the defendant in over 14 years and only reconnected with him two months prior, at which time defendant's legal troubles had already surfaced. Moreover, in reaching their dementia diagnosis, which requires consideration of defendant's present abilities to perform certain activities of daily living, or ADLs, the doctors based their opinion solely on the defense investigator's report of her interview with Margarita Munoz, the program coordinator at Sunrise Defendant Senior Living Facility. However, as established during Ms. Munoz's testimony, much was omitted from that initial interview. For example, Ms. Munoz testified that neither she nor her staff spend that much time with the defendant. In fact, Ms. Munoz only sees him occasionally when he stops by her office and his care manager spends maybe an hour a day with him. Well, they'd be spending a lot more time with him if he was unable to take care of his daily living activities. Moreover, they say Ms. Munoz testified that staff from defendant's previous senior living facility were confused about why his family was escalating his level of care given his independence. Right, because especially post-2020, senior living is tremendously stressed for staffing levels. So I imagine that if the level of care doesn't seem appropriate to them, they're like, what is happening? We don't have this level of care for someone who does not need it. Indeed, for the past two years, defendant has been at the lowest care level at Sunrise, level one out of five, which reflects near total independence with need for minimal reminders, a fact that the doctor conceded is significant. Significant, but didn't consider it? How are we not considering those who are day-to-day -day caretaking as those who know the most about this patient? You would think that the senior living facility that deals with memory patients would be in the best position because if he needed to be escalated, they would escalate his care level, but they don't need to, so they're not. It seems like this is some pretty significant information about whether or not he is presently competent. They go on to say, as for defendant's recent drastic decline, Ms. Munoz testified this began shortly after his indictment in this matter, timing that is both highly suspect and inconsistent with Dr. Chu's, Chewy's opinion that the defendant's illness is slow progressing. So what we have is the treating physician who no clinical evaluation saying that this is a slow progressing cognitive decline, the care facility where he lives saying that he had a drastic decline after his indictment and the two not considering each other's statements because the forensic evaluator needs to be considering what the care facility said the care facility needs to be considering what the patient is presenting oh boy they go on to say in some the evidence presented during the competency hearing demonstrates that the defendant has been intentionally exaggerating his impairment since 2020 his claims of being unaware of his criminal and civil exposure, which have persisted until present day, are demonstrably false and evidences his cunningness and thus his competency to proceed. They go on to say that the defendant understands the nature of the proceedings and can aid in his defense. Neither party disputes that the defendant, an 84-year-old, exhibits some form of cognitive impairment. However, the mere presence of mental disease or defect is not significant to render a defendant incompetent. Each of defendant's clinical interviews in connection with this proceeding demonstrated his understanding of the charges against him. That is the standard. During interviews with the government's experts, defendant accurately recalled that he was being accused of not paying clients, a fact, a fact discussed earlier in the meeting, and then related at several points over the three-day examination without prompting that he did nothing wrong and he did not steal from clients. Likewise, in his interview with Dr. Darby, despite disclaiming knowledge of the indictment, defendant frequently told Dr. Darby that he did not steal anything, echoing his comments to Dr. Goldstein, while acknowledging that Girardi Key's clients may not have received all the funds to which they were entitled. 
I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a real gross understatement. Even the defense expert, Dr. Wood, conceded that notwithstanding the defendant's claims to the contrary, she believed he actually does have an appreciation of the criminal charges against him. And that is part of the standard. Does he know what he's being charged with? Does he understand the charges against him? And it seems that everybody agrees that he does, which is going to tend towards him being able to be criminally responsible for his behavior. They say that defendant also has the capacity to consult meaningfully and rationally with his counsel if he chooses to do so. Indeed, defendant outlined his defense strategies for the experts, strategies that Dr. Wood conceded were rational and sound. And this is the difficult thing because you don't want to invade the province of the attorney-client privilege, but you have to know whether he's helping his defense attorneys. And one of the ways to do that is through the doctor's having a conversation with him about it. And earlier in this proceeding, some of that had been redacted and there was argument in court over what would not be redacted for the prosecutors because you don't want to disclose the defense strategy. But the fact that the doctor had reviewed the defense strategy that the defendant was laying out for them and said, this is rational thinking. He's not saying something that is so preposterous that it's not a rational train of thought. And for any of you thinking, oh, was he arguing like, I'm a sovereign citizen? Even that, if it has a rational train of thought, would not be considered not competent. It's like, I I disagree that this is the position of the law, but you have a logical train of thought that you want to follow. It would have to be something so outside the boundaries of reasonable, rational, or logical that then it would raise questions. And that's not what we're seeing here according to this report or this argument from the prosecution. They go on to say that the court further observed defendant's ability to process information firsthand when he hurled an expletive under his breath at the prosecutor. And then they cited that little moment in the transcript. Well, when the transcripts become public, we'll go look at the context ourselves. But the court saw it in real time that defendant was frustrated with the prosecution because he wasn't getting his way. And he yelled at them, which is consistent with his voicemails that have been put into motions from Edelson PC and others, because we saw when Tom got frustrated that he would scream at people and berate them. But it started first with, oh, I'm a nice guy. Take it easy on me. I've had this going on and that going on and really playing into, I'm just, oh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm just a country lawyer. I'm just a nice guy. You know, don't, don't be mean to me. But then when he would get pissed, he would snap and start screaming and threatening at people. Such examples, they say, highlight defendant's true ability to track and process information in real time and understand the significance of that information. Other evidence further corroborated this assessment of defendant's cognitive abilities. For example, Dr. Wood conceded that except for some facets of memory, defendant's remaining cognitive domains were relatively normal and in some cases above average. That is probably going to be enough to find him competent to stand trial. Competent does not mean no impairment. Competent is a very low standard. It is set at a preponderance, understanding the charges, aiding counsel. It goes on to say this includes his attention, processing speed, executive functioning, and even working memory, which was a relative strength. And while defendant's brain scans show abnormal hippocampal atrophy, the defense experts agree that this atrophy dates back to at least 2017, and thus, during the time when the atrophy was present, defendant still functioned normally up until late 2020 when allegations of his misappropriation were made public. Is 2017 when he had the car accident? It seemed like he did, in fact, have some type of a vehicular accident with some type of a brain injury. It goes on to say, accordingly, the evidence presented at the competency hearing demonstrated that the defendant clearly has a rational and factual understanding of the charges against him and that he has the capacity to consult meaningfully with his attorneys if he so chooses. His insistence on being unaware of his legal situation is willful and deliberate. He can opt to participate meaningfully in these proceedings at any time. Conclusions. For the foregoing reason, the government respectfully requests that this court find the defendant competent and set this matter for trial. The government has filed. We will see the defense response in about three weeks. And then a reply if we get one from the government. And then the court will take this under submission and issue a written ruling at some point. I'm interested to see what the defense says, but the 
prosecution makes some very good arguments that the defendant, though he is showing some cognitive impairment, which I wonder how much it is normal for his age, it seems that no one is arguing this is abnormal for his age, that he shows some cognitive impairment, it is not to the point that he is not competent to be prosecuted for the crimes he's alleged to have committed. And speaking of the fallout from the crimes he's alleged to have committed, we need to go talk about Erica Girardi and the scandal earrings, because that saga is not done. Some of you may remember the Erica Girardi scandal earrings. We've talked about them quite a lot. The scandal earrings were given back to the bankruptcy trustee in the law firm bankruptcy. We had seen evidence that the earrings or a pair of earrings, because that's in contention, that a pair of earrings were purchased by Tom Girardi directly out of a client trust account with a check written out of the client trust account to the jeweler for seven carat each, like each ear, seven carat each diamond studs. A pair of earrings was turned over to the trustee. The trustee then sold them. The earrings that were turned back over were six carats, not seven carats. But anyway, we'll get to that in a bit. Erica has argued and has argued on appeal that those monies that were used to buy the earrings uh, could have been attorney's fees that were owed to Tom Girardi. There's other reasons why these earrings might not be recoverable by the trustee and that they shouldn't have been given back to the trustee and argued that up on appeal, though did not object to the earrings being sold. The earrings were subsequently sold at auction for substantially less than they were purchased for. We've also seen the earrings factor heavily on last season of Real Housewives of Beverly Hills when Erica was talking about, you know, more like 1.3 because the check that came out was for $750,000. I think the earrings ultimately sold for like $200,000, $250,000. But Erica was joking that they were worth, um, you know, $1.3 million or whatever while she was in Aspen on a trip. This went up on appeal. The appellate court made some findings and remanded it back to the lower court. The remand means that the lower court needs to now sort out what to do with it. The appellate court said, go look more closely at this. What we're looking at today is the status conference of the positioning of the parties and some more argument going on now in the appeals court and some more argument going on now back in the bankruptcy court over these earrings. So this is like a lawsuit inside the bankruptcy. So the bankruptcy trustee and Erica are fighting over essentially the proceeds to the earrings and where they should go, whether or not that was money that the bankruptcy trustee is entitled to. Reality TV watchers, at some point, you're going to have to tell me what you're more gripped by, Scandal or Scandal Earrings. I'm, or just the TV show Scandal, where you like, forget all this reality stuff. Bring back Scandal. Let's continue. This is a joint status conference report, which should give us the position of the parties post appeal. JSR joint status report regarding remand order and request of parties for a briefing schedule. On May 1st, 2023, the district court issued its remand order. In the remand order, the district court made the following determinations. One, Mr. Artie had standing to prosecute the appeal. Two, the appeal was not equitably moot. Three, the trustee's motion, which led to the issuance of this court's July 11th, 2022 order, was not barred by the statute of limitations or the statute of repose. Four, in the turnover motion, the trustee had not met her burden to show that the funds used in 2007 to purchase the earrings at issue were the property of the girardi Kisa estate due to commingling of funds. Based on the foregoing, the district court reversed the turnover order in part and remanded the matter for further proceedings in which the trustee would bear the burden of proof on the commingling issue. The commingling issue is, was this money, money that belonged to Girardi Keys, the law firm? Is this money that belongs to the clients whose trust account it came out of? Or was this money that was part of the attorney's fees to be taken out of the trust account anyway, and the money really belonged to Tom Girardi? So who does this money belong to when Girardi's funds were commingled in a messy way? On August 23rd, this court entered an order granting the trustee's motion for order, A, authorizing the trustee to close and consolidate the trust and IOLTA bank accounts, attorney on interest loan trust accounts, interest on loan trust accounts, 
They're the attorney trust accounts, I-O-L-T-A. B, confirming the bank's authority as to the minor's blocked bank accounts pursuant to 11 U.S.C. 721. And C, abandoning the city bank account pursuant to 11 U.S.C. 554. The court also overruled Ms. Girardi's opposition to the trustee's motion. Based on the foregoing, the parties request that this court set a briefing schedule to address the following legal issues raised by the remand order and the consolidation order. One, whether the consolidation order is issue determinative and preclusive of the commingling issue addressed by the remand order. Two, if so, whether a partial judgment should be entered in favor of the trustee on the turnover motion, including a determination that the trustee is entitled to keep the proceeds of the sale of the earrings. Three, if the consolidation order is not issue determinative of the commingling issue, that is the subject of the remand order, whether, based upon the remand order, Girardi has standing to pursue her rights to the proceeds of the sale of the earrings, notwithstanding the district court's remand order to the contrary. The parties agree that the foregoing are threshold issues that must be decided before the parties proceed to address further on remand the commingling issue described in the remand order. Among other things, such further proceedings may require additional discovery and the retention of expert witnesses. So the parties are saying, look, your honor, listen, your honor, listen, 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 Linda. We have determined that these three questions need to be answered. Can you please answer these questions for us to determine whether or not we need to even unmess the commingling? Because the court has made other orders, can you please answer these questions before we get like part one, part two. Can we do part one first? Because part one might determine whether we even need a part two. Pre-trial conference. The parties have worked diligently to prepare a joint pre-trial stipulation and have exchanged drafts of a proposed pre-trial stipulation and order, as well as an initial exhibit and witness list. Counsel for the parties has met and conferred numerous times to discuss the admitted and disputed issues. Based on the foregoing, the parties request that the court set a briefing schedule. The court did set a briefing schedule. So let's take a look at what we can expect with regard to the scandal hearings. Scheduling order. The hearing on the remand order shall be held November 14th at 10 a.m. The trustee's opening brief shall be filed or served on or before October 24th, 2023. Defendant's responsive brief shall be filed and served on or before November 1st. Trustee's reply brief shall be filed and served before November 7th. So the responsive brief and the reply brief are due this week and into next week and we already have the opening brief and we're going to take a look at the initial statements from the bankruptcy trustee regarding the remand on appeal of the scandal earrings emily the earrings were sold why isn't this done because it's not done it's not done i still don't understand why erica's attorney didn't actually seek to stay the sale of the earrings because once the earrings are sold, there's only so much you can do. The trustee has a very interesting footnote in this motion, wherein the question of whether or not the earrings that were turned over and sold and the earrings that were bought with the $750,000 check are in fact the same earrings. It seems strange that the earrings would lose like a full carrot. Like, you know, they're not doing keto. So what what what's happening with the earrings and why are the earrings that were listed on a receipt that had all of the gemology listings and and stuff why are those different than the earrings that were turned over i broke it down more than once on the channel like these are the earrings that were bought with the seven hundred and fifty thousand dollar check these are the earrings that were turned over for auction those earrings are different weights and different sizes last i checked diamonds don't just shrink but they may be a girl's best friend so what we're going to talk about now is the opening brief from the trustee who is suing Erica over the scandal earrings. Introduction and summary. Oh boy. After her appointment as the Chapter 7 trustee, the plaintiff, Trustee Miller, conducted a review of the Girardi Keys trust accounts. The review led to the discovery of Thomas Girardi's massive fraud, his embezzlement of millions of dollars of client trust funds, and what was essentially a criminal enterprise operated by Girardi disguised as a law firm footnote too. It's interesting because that's what Edelson PC has argued. Um, I also argued that this was a, this felt 
very Ponzi scheme ish at the beginning all of the of all of this the way that you know new money was coming in from clients and going out to pay old client debts which is not how any of this works like the client who gets a judgment paid that money goes into a trust account for that client and then goes to that client it's not commingled with other clients so it felt very ponzi schemey to me at the beginning um We've seen Edelson PC allege that it is running as a essentially a criminal enterprise, a RICO organization. And footnote two says, on January 31st, 2023, the grand jury sitting in Los Angeles issued a five count indictment against Tom Girardi and Christopher Kamen, Girardi Keese's former chief financial officer. The indictment charged the defendants with wire fraud and criminal forfeiture. One of Girardi's crimes was the theft of $750,000 from the Comerica Bank GK client trust account, Girardi perpetrated his crime when he issued a check drawn against the trust account to Eminem, then used the check to pay for the diamond earrings purchased from a downtown jeweler doing business as Eminem jewelry. Girardi then attempted to conceal his theft by recording the purpose of the check on the check register as costs. If you want to see me rant about this, go watch me the day I figured out or saw that this was listed as costs. But sidebar real quick, the reason that this is so much fuckery is because when you're looking at how attorneys take money out of, of contingency fees, the attorneys get the lump sum payment. Say it's a million dollar um, settlement on a case. The attorneys take their attorney's fees first. So if their attorney's fees are for 40%, they take 40% off of the million dollar settlement. Then they take their costs, whatever their hard costs are for hiring experts, paying the attorneys, what well, no attorney's fees get taken, hiring experts, paying for experts, paying for reconstructions, uh, paying for photocopies, all the rest of it, paying for filing fees, those come out as costs. What is left over at the end goes to the clients, if anything. It goes on to say this further defrauded the clients as the cost was deducted from the gross payout. Upon discovering this information, the trustee requested defendant Erica Girardi turn the earrings over to the trustee for the benefit of the estate's creditors. Her refusal to do so forced the trustee to file a turnover motion, which was supported by two evidentiary declarations that included an introduction of the copy of the check used for the payment and the case ledger that recorded the check as being used for the payment as costs. Erica opposed the motion, but failed to submit any evidence in opposition to the trustee's evidence. I mean, at some point, how could you though? Like, if your spouse gives you something and is like, I bought you this, how do you prove how they paid for it? How do you prove how they paid for it over a decade later, two decades later? Erica opposed the motion but failed to submit any evidence in opposition to the trustee's evidence. The court, having considered the evidence, approved the turnover motion by order entered on July 11th, 2022. Erica's appeal of the turnover order led to the district court partially upholding and partially overturning the turnover order. The district court remanded the motion back to this court for additional proceedings to examine a specific evidentiary matter. This matter concerns whether Girardi Keys, in its administration of the Comerica Trust account, commingled Girardi Keys funds or funds of Tom Girardi with the settlement funds Girardi Keys received from the resolution of the client's case. This examination is crucial for establishing a legal conclusion that the funds derived from the sale of the earrings should be considered part of the estate's assets. Footnote three. The trustee takes exception to the district court's conclusion that there was no evidence before the court to establish commingling and Girardi's embezzlement. The trustee did not appeal the district court's order for very practical reasons. The time and cost of appeal simply was not in the best interest of the estate and its creditors and was confident this court could review the issue quicker than the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. So at that point, the trustee is saying, we disagree with what the court did, but we cannot appeal the appeal court ruling higher up. We're just going to let this court handle it. However, on August 23rd, 2023, this court entered an order, the consolidation order, approving the trustee's motion for order, authorizing the trustee to close and consolidate 
the trust and IOLTA bank accounts, et cetera. The consolidation motion sought authorization with one limited exception, to close and consolidate the debtor's remaining trust accounts and to transfer the balances from those accounts into the trustee's debtor account as property of the estate. The basis for that motion is that the trust accounts were out of trust and that the mix of non-client transactions and transactions involving the settlement of the client cases were so commingled as to render the ability to separate out the transactions impossible and accordingly the trust res is property of the estate so the the money in the trusts is now property of the estate notably only one objection to the motion was filed not surprisingly it came from erica an objection that was summarily rejected by the court on hearing of the consolidation motion held august 15th 2023 given erica presented no evidence whatsoever in support of her position the court also admonished erica's counsel for filing frivolous objections erica did not appeal the consolidation order and accordingly the consolidation order is now final and not subject to further challenge that order therefore raced judicata as to the issue of commingling and conclusively decides the issue of commingling for all parties who participated in the proceedings which includes erica having resolved the issue posed by the district court that there was commingling in the trust accounts that supported a legal conclusion that the trust res was property of the estate this court should now render judgment on the trustees turnover motion in favor of the trustee so what is being argued is that because the consolidation order was made by this judge and the consolidation order said everything in the trust accounts it doesn't matter what client trust accounts they're supposed to be it is such a clusterfuck that there is no way to say this dollar goes to this client and that dollar goes to this other client it is just all commingled it all needs to go into the estate of the bankruptcy and then be parsed back out to the debtors according to the order in the bankruptcy they are further arguing that because the court has ordered that consolidation motion it essentially makes moot the other motion because the matter has been decided by this court the matter that needed to be decided on remand so the appellate court remanded it back and said hey you need to decide if these funds were commingled but the court has decided on another motion that because everything was commingled it was consolidated so it answers the other questions it says moreover the district's court's order wasn't limited to a direction to inquire further into the ownership of the trust funds in fact the district court affirmed the trustee's position that regardless of whether the money was commingled and therefore the earrings were property of the estate or the property of the beneficiaries of the trust account erica as the recipient of the fruits of the money stolen from the trust account does not have any right or interest in the earrings or the proceeds of the sale thereof this ruling is the law of the case as such although the district court found that erica had standing to prosecute the appeal given that she was the defendant in an adversary action based on the district court's ruling erica no longer has a pecuniary interest in the proceeds of the earrings accordingly this court should enter judgment in favor of the trustee on the turnover motion without further consideration to erica's arguments finally the evidence of commingling as presented in the previous declarations filed in support of the motion and support of the consolidation motions when considered with the declaration from nicholas trozak a managing director at developmental specialist the duly appointed forensic accountant for the trustee submitted herewith establishes by more than a preponderance of the evidence that commingling took place in the trust account and is essentially the same type of commingling that occurred post 2013. that testimony elucidates the resulin settlement funds were not placed in a separate trust account but rather in the larger comerica trust account which held settlement funds from other various Girardi Keys representations. The forensic accountant's testimony also reveals that between 2002 and 2010, Girardi made direct payments totaling over $2 million from the trust account 
to GNL Aviation and Girardi and Walter Lack General Partnership, which they use to hold titled and resort properties, private airlines, and yachts. So not only did the court say, yes, everything's so commingled, it just needs to be consolidated, but we're also learning that the forensic accountant, not the one that quit, the new, the current forensic accountant, between 2002 and 2010, found that the trust account just had stuff being written out of it, over $2 million going to planes, resort properties, and yachts. You... Trust accounts are to hold money in trust, not to write checks out of for yachts. I mean, what? I've already told you that these attorneys get a settlement for their injured plaintiffs, people that are harmed, the loved ones of people who were killed. And then first they take their legal fees. Full stop. They get 100% of the money. First, they take their legal fees between 30 and 40%. Then they take their cost to reimburse the law firm. Then the client gets paid. How is that not enough money? How is that not enough money? Pay for your fucking yacht yourself or don't. I don't care. Don't pay for it out of your client trust account. You're already taking your money off the top. The smallest portion in these payouts goes to the client already. Stop it. Oh, there's more. It's too late in the show for this shit. An additional $3.2 million was paid directly from the trust account for Girardi's real estate investment in PAC-10. And there was a $750,000 payout for the purchase of the earrings. During this same period, Girardi deposited $29.1 million into the trust account, indicating that money flowed into the account from TVG, TVG loans, or funds accounted for under case number 10001, case name TVG. Jordy Keys also dispersed $31.5 million in checks and made transfers, demonstrating that payments were made to TVG, TVG loan, or were accounted for under case number 10001. Sounds like a made-up case number to me. These deposits and payments unequivocally establish the commingling of personal funds with client trust funds, a direct violation of the rules of professional conduct, 1.15. I mean, yeah, at a, at, at a minimum, the rule of professional conduct explicitly prohibits commingling of trust funds with a lawyer's or law firm's personal funds. Yeah. This compelling evidence, which cannot be refuted by Erica, establishes by a preponderance of the evidence that the commingling occurred from 2002 to 2010 and that the funds in the trust account, including the proceeds from the sale of the earrings, should be designated as property of the estate. Statement of facts, footnote five, given the extensive proceedings in this case, over almost three years since the bankruptcy filing, the trustee will forgo presenting an established background, and foundational facts and limit the factual discussion to the facts specifically relevant to the issues presented by the court's order, which we're not even going to get to because we've already gone through it. On June 1st, 2023, the trustee filed a motion for order authorizing the consolidation. The consolidation motion sought authorization with one limited exception to close the accounts. The request was made following the forensic accountant's analysis of the debtor's transactions over the seven-year period preceding the commencement of the bankruptcy. During this period, the debtor deposited and distributed over... That... That's... That's three commas. Why is that three commas? That number has three commas. Over a billion dollars. Comprising more than 400 million from non-trust accounts and 600 million for trust bank accounts. The forensic accountants discovered that the debtor's trust and IOLTA accounts were out of trust and not properly separated with one limited exception. Oh, so they did know how to do it. Resulting in commingling of funds. 
The forensic accountant also noted that tracing the source of the funds had proven to be prohibitively expensive and practically impossible, further complicated by the unavailability of bank records for periods preceding the seven-year analysis. Notably, only one objection was filed. Not surprising, it came from Erica. And then this motion lists out the commingling and tracks different transactions going in and out of this trust account in a way that shouldn't have happened, including things like payment for GNL aviation, transfers to other accounts, loan proceeds, a loan to Tom Girardi. When they say TVG, by the way, it's Thomas Vincent Girardi. So direct loans for him, including a million, he took a million dollars out of this trust account on January 28th, 2005. Just, yep. And it says loan. There's so much fuckery. We know of the fuckery. We know this. It says notably Girardi made payments totaling over $2 million to the GNL av Aviation, a general partnership owned by Girardi and Walter Lack, which they used to finance their use of private airplanes and yachts and to hold title to various luxury vacation homes. An additional $3.2 million was allocated for Girardi's real estate investments. See, you guys, this is how the rich invest in real estate. They just take other people's money to do it. It's wild. And then the payment of the earrings. During the same period, Girardi, and we already went through this. This is the rest that we've gone through. Let's get to the comment about the earrings. But at the end of the day, the trustee is arguing, I don't need to prove to you that the funds were commingled because I've already proven to you that the funds were commingled. And this court has already ruled on that in another ruling. So that ruling holds, that ruling that the funds were commingled holds and governs over this ruling. So there's nothing else for the court to do is what they are arguing. And just for all of you who want the definition of race judicata, I knew we would get to it in the description here and the argument further, but it is the doctrine of claim preclusion, race judicata, bars any subsequent suit on claims that were raised or could have been raised in a prior action. Claim preclusion applies when there is one, an identity of claims, two, a final judgment on the merits, and three, identity or privity between the parties. This has already been settled, so you cannot argue it more. So as we get to the conclusion, the trustee says, the district court's order never provided a windfall to Erica to receive stolen client funds that were used to purchase her replacement earrings from an alleged burglary. The money used to purchase the earrings is either a state property or the client's property, but it is not Erica's property under any scenario. This undisputed finding by this court and the district court precludes Erica from any claim to the proceeds from the sale of the earrings. She cannot profit from her husband's thefts of his client's money any longer. And that should be cleared up in any order or finding by this court, footnote nine. Even though Erica eventually turned over the earrings to the trustee, there is controversy as to whether or not the earrings Erica gave the trustee were the same diamonds purchased with the trust funds in 2007. In Mr. Uh, Mescul Mesculinens, m and Jewelers, I cannot pronounce his last name, Menzicillian, I think I got that. In Mr. Menzicillian's declaration, that's the m and Jeweler, he stated that, quote, on March 2nd, 2007, I sold Thomas V. Girardi a pair of earrings that were approximately seven carats each. Yet the diamonds Erica turned over to the trustee were one 6.01 carats and two 6.57 carats. See the GIA certificates. And remember, the jeweler had GIA certificate numbers on the receipt that we have gone over. So that is the footnote at the end of the thing calling out again that these earrings don't seem to be the same. Conclusion, as presented above, the evidence proffered by the trustee clearly establishes that the Comerica Trust account was so irrevocably commingled with the personal funds and transactions of Thomas Girardi that the proceeds from the sale of the earrings are clearly assets of the estate subject to administration by the trustee. The trustee is arguing, look, the money goes to the estate to pay back the people that the debtor Girardi Keys owes. This goes back to the creditors that include legal lenders, former clients, 
and others. They are arguing that is where that money should go or whatever is left of it after all of this litigation. Hopefully that makes sense why they are still fighting over these funds for the earring. Erica saying, look, you can't just come in here this many years later, take the earrings and sell them off, but I will give you the earrings and then I will fight with you that you are not doing the legally proper thing. And the trustee saying, all of these funds were so commingled. He wrote a check out of the client trust account. These are assets that we can recover back into the bankruptcy to pay back out to those that are owed money. And again, there is not going to be enough money left here. There are substantially more debts than assets, which is why the trustee is fighting over every dollar that they can find, because there are substantially more debts than assets. And unfortunately, with the way bankruptcy works, the secured creditors are going to get paid first. The secured creditors are mostly the legal lenders. And there is litigation going on over that that we will cover another day, where the trustee is trying to make sure it seems that the clients get paid as well. But there will be clients who will never recover their funds. And that is one of the reasons I will continue to cover this case. Because though we know more about some of the client victims in the Murdoch case, and a lot of that's because of the murder trial, there are so many more clients here. This scheme went on for substantially longer than Murdoch's scheme. We don't know all of their names and faces. We don't know all of their stories. But there are so many of them who have been deceived by the person that they trusted to take care of them. And that is something I would love to see righted. And I don't think at the end of the day we're going to see it righted, but at least we can acknowledge that it's happened. And with that, law nerds, there is a lot going on in the Girardi sphere. I will be interested to see how the court rules on competency. I think the court will probably find him competent based on what we've seen, but who knows? And if they do, maybe that case will go to trial in federal court sometime in 2024 with Girardi and his CFO. And then there's still the criminal proceedings in Illinois with Girardi and two of his co-conspirator slash co-counsels, one of which is his son-in-law, and we will see that moving forward as well. So with all of this, if you would like to keep up with the Real Housewives legal stuff, you've got to let me know in the comments that these stories are interesting to you. I thank you for being here. I thank you for being a law nerd. I will be at BravoCon. My kids are starting to call it DramaCon. I'm starting to call it DramaCon now too. So that's where I will be this week. Keep an eye around social media for updates. And members, I will have behind the scenes stuff for you in your member spaces. And with that, so thank you for being here. Thank you for being a law nerd. May your Wi-Fi be strong. May your toilet paper be plentiful. I hope that your Halloween was lovely and fruitful and spooky fun. May your family be well. May the odds be ever in your favor. I will see you in the next one. Bye, Law Nerd. You can stay up to date with everything I'm covering and fast notifications on our free iOS and Android app at lawnerdapp.com or search the App Store for Law Nerd. You can also follow me around social media. And don't forget to check out my podcast, The Emily Show, with quick bits dropping every Monday, summarizing everything I do here on the live streams on Tuesday and Thursday for when you just have time for the quick bits. Thanks for being a law nerd.